Greetings and welcome to this uh, special webcast from the IMCCA. We're all homebound and doing the best we can in the face of a global pandemic, the uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, which somebody put a comedic uh, poster up on the internet today, sounded more like a, a corporate webcasting video application than, than, than a virus. But um, I'm joined by a number of analyst friends of mine, and I'm going to call on them to ask them to introduce themselves. And, and today's webcast is going to be specifically about how the you know, UCNC industry and the collaboration industry is responding and what are the challenges and, uh, and uh, uh, pieces about that. So uh, um, why don't we start with you, Blair, since I'm looking at you right now, why don't you introduce yourself and tell people what you do? Sure, uh, I'm Blair Pleasant, I'm President and Principal Analyst of ComFusion and co-founder of BC Strategies. I'm an independent analyst and I cover unified communications, collaboration, contact center, and pretty much anything that falls under the business communication realm. Terrific, thank you, Blair. And Brent, you're next. All right. Thank you, David. My name is Brent Kelly. I am the president and principal analyst at Calco Incorporated. I run a boutique analyst and consulting firm that focuses on this area of business, business communications. And I'm in the process of a pivot to adding into that how artificial intelligence plays in with these communications practices and processes that we see. Terrific, thank you, Brent. David, you're next on my list. Uh, hi, I'm David Maldo. I'm the founder and lead guitarist at Let's Do Video, where we cover team productivity um, and everything having to do with, actually, I'm, it sounds like I'm exploding, but remote teamwork is what I've been talking about for five years at Let's Do Video. That's great, David. Thank you very much. Mark, can you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Mark Peterson. I work for Shen, Mills & Wilkie, a consulting firm, and I lead the audiovisual practice, and I am also involved in unified communications and collaboration, and I do a lot of work with enterprise. Terrific. Thanks very much, Mark. And Tim, you're the last on today. Go ahead. Thank you, David. My name is Tim Banting. I'm a principal uh, analyst at Omdia, the new name for the collective of uh, Ovum Dark Reading, IHS Market, and Tractica. And how do we pronounce that again? Tell me so that I'm aware of it. It's Omdia. Omdia. Okay, it almost yes. sounds like a mantra. Okay, that's really cool. All right, so guys, uh, uh, thank you very much. First of all, it's good to see you all. It's good to see you all healthy. Um, we're a little bit of doing a little bit of preaching to the choir today because we are all um, very versed in remote collaboration and working from home. It's something we all do. I know that I've been preaching for the last decade more than that actually to, to to tell organizations look you need to get your remote working strategy in place there'll be another pandemic i've got a blog that specifically says that calls out that there's going to be a pandemic or a breach or something and people are going to need to work remotely um, you need to get your business continuity plans how do we think industry has responded and and our customers have responded are enough of them um, were enough of them ready or did we catch a lot of people off guard I think we caught a lot of people off guard, David. Um, I think a lot of people had disaster recovery plans in place, and that typically focuses on um, IT restoring infrastructure and operations after a crisis. Um, but what it doesn't do is sort of look at all the other parts of the business. So the people, the places where people will have to eventually work from, the process, um, ex the extension of the digital supply chain across partners and suppliers, all of that gets effective, affected. So it's all well and good having a nice uh, all singing, all dancing network, but if no one can get into the office, it's pointless. So that doesn't only just uh, extend to pandemics, as bad as those are. That could be everything from alien invasions to bad snow days to earthquakes to anything. So I think basically we've been caught unawares. And what really does highlight to me is these things need to be practiced, whether or not that's for, for, for in real or whether or not that's in a boardroom as a paperwork exercise. I think we've been caught largely off guard. The one thing I've heard is, you know, we talk about how easy these tools are, but I've been hearing from a lot of people that they're just not ready for it. And because people haven't used those tools and they haven't been trained in it, that they're having a really hard time. And a lot of help desks are being overwhelmed from internal people um, calling and saying, you know, I don't know how to use this. I don't know how to set up my video. I don't know how to set up my uh, find me, follow me. So a lot of help desks are being overwhelmed from internal people who just don't know how to use these tools. So that goes back to my mantra about user adoption and user training. 
we Blair, that's practice? a great point. You know, at, when I've talked to some of our corporate clients, they've done, they did some, you know, exercises in terms of bandwidth capacity, looking at it from the, the context of how many calls they could contain, but they weren't looking at the end, end user support and establishing all of the models in place. The other thing is that remote working doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to provide the high bandwidth requirements if you're working through AutoCAD and other high intensive programs. So having remote desktop is, is really kind of the, the key lynch in understanding the capabilities is key. Yeah, you know, I, I agree that, that we're not ready. And I think part of it is we still have this old mindset of the physical office is work and these are these are backups, these are add-ons, these are helper solutions. And um, I used to work at an office, and when I started Let's Do Video, it is a remote team. So I had to make the cloud the office. And if Let's Do Video someday gets to the point where it's big enough to have a physical office, that will be a nice to have. And if it ever shuts down because of something like this or just the power goes out, it won't interrupt work because everything you need in an office, you could have remotely. I don't wanna to take too much time, but really quick, when I started Let's Do Video, the, the three things that I had in the office that I had to recreate virtually were my people. I had them at the office, my files, I had physical files at the office, and my tools. So now I have my people virtually through video and chat. I have my files virtually, obviously, easily, we all do. And my tools, I use all these remote tools. I can work anywhere. So if we had that mindset that work now is the cloud and the physical office is the nice to have, this would be a much less of a disruption. So do well, you I'll guys... be the last one to, ahead, Brent. Yeah, David, please. if I may, if I could just, just add a comment. I think what we're seeing here really is, is something that um, might be called a black swan event, and that comes from a, a well-known book in the financial world about really unexpected things that can happen. And I think what is unexpected is that entire countries would shut down or that entire states would shut down or as has happened in the San Francisco Bay Area, 6.7 million people all of a sudden are asked to stay at home. I think none of us really expected that and I don't know how you plan for that kind of an event um, where people that normally would never expect to work out of the office are now required to work out of the office by government. Um, and, and so I think we need to be just a little bit more gentle on the business leaders and, and those of us who are, you know, who are prepared to work this kind of way and we do it all the time. I, I think this truly is an anomaly, a black swan event, and we're going to get through it. We'll teach people how to use the tools to get by and so forth. And yeah, there'll be some hiccups, but we're going to get through this and I think we'll do it just fine. Well, the, the, my big question is more uh, about uh, change. You know, the, the, the people who, business publications as an example. Um, the business publications for years, the majority of them have been saying remote work is terrible and working from home is lazy and they've been highlighting the stories about the three or four leaders that take over failing businesses and bring all the, 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 the remote workers back in because it's terrible. And, you know, that's all scapegoating. They're all saying that it, it couldn't work, it couldn't possibly work. For the most part now, at least for knowledge workers, it is working. And now all these same publications are putting out articles claiming that they have expertise in it and telling everybody, oh, you have to make sure that you move around and do your desk and you know all these you know some I don't want to I don't want to be too insane but but some good and, and many bad tips as opposed to saying oh you know what we were wrong look everybody is able to continue to function and businesses are moving forward at least many of them are yes the Starbucks has changed yes the construction site has changed you know those are things that we can't get to the malls and the supermarkets are going through what they're going through but for the typical knowledge workers you know I have more I know you guys know this as well but I have more connectivity more screens more tools more ability to work here in my my home office than I do in any office that a company could provide for me. And and do we think that the tide has turned? Is there going to be less stigma around this and, 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 and more people understanding that this model is a functional, good for everybody, successful model? So I'm looking at you, Brent. Why don't you go first this time? Well, all right. Thank you. So um, my sense is that um, we're seeing now what we saw, uh, eight, well, even to a greater degree, back in 2000, when was it, seven or eight with the SARS uh, epidemic, I was working very heavily in the video conferencing industry and everybody was saying, this is gonna prove you know, that video conferencing is good and great and everybody's gonna use it. And, and they did, and, and it got us through that crisis. I think 
really at the heart of part of this is that we as people like to mingle and interact with one another. And so in addition to having all the tools and all that great stuff, which I have too, I think there's a sense that we are social people. We like to meet together. And, and, and I don't think that this epidemic will necessarily change that desire. What we will have and see is that, yeah, we have tools people are going to adopt some tools that maybe they haven't adopted before. This ability to work from home is probably going to last for a while longer. We have this kind of a peak where lots of people are going to work and then I predict it's going to decline again just because we like to be together socially. I'm not saying this is going to not stick. I'm saying that it will stick in part, but I think people will still want to meet in person if they can. I think a couple of things to, to, add, to add to Brent's really good points is um, one thing is, you know, we can't take desk home, we can't take desk phones home with us. So I think that's going to highlight areas of weaknesses in um, business continuity strategy. We also need to make sure that our knowledge workers um, can work with our frontline workers as well, so that everyone's got all the same tools and everyone can talk throughout the digital supply chain, the people that deal with customers, the people that work in offices or work from home, partners and suppliers, they all need to talk together. So I think that there's going to be an awful lot of strategy that gets reassessed after this event. Um, and, and I think that's only a good thing. Um, I really don't see the point of uh, desk phones anymore. If you, you know, if you then think as a part of your business continuity, how are you going to, you know, communicate? You can't use the tinny speakers and, and microphones in your laptop, that they're just not effective. They don't portray a very, um, a very professional image. I have a slightly different perspective on that, Tim. You know, what I've seen in talking to peers that are running their own companies, uh, the conversations that they're having aren't about connectivity. I mean, at this point, we were actually quite fortunate if we if we were if this was occurring a couple of years ago, we'd have a much bigger problem in terms of communication and the issues around technology. The conversations I'm hearing are about HR, logistics, closing the companies, the, it, the conversations are moving right into the topics that are critical for those companies to work. And that's a phenomenal change from where we were a couple of years ago. So from a productivity point of view, and this being the new normal, I see the conversations, and maybe people don't realize it, but when they're connecting and talking to their peers, they're getting their work done extremely effectively, and they don't even realize how much of, a, of you know, that, that it used to be a problem to try to get on a call and have everybody be able to see and hear each other, at least in the conversations I'm seeing. And this also you know, goes back, I had many years of, of being able to be remote and have to be in a meeting uptown and then be in a meeting downtown you know, where people have to travel and, and open up a door. And I'm on video and I'm able to get right into the call and I'm able to make my notes because I'm the only one who's not in the conference room. So I have a tool set, toolkit with me. And I think that's, I think where we need to move the conversations further with our, with our, uh, with the customers and with people in this industry is understand that the conversation doesn't just end with a live call. You need to have places to park your information. We have to work in a new model that combines both the data and the video, asynchronous communications and collaboration with the live is really key. And I'm, I'm hoping that kind of message gets through to people in terms of how do you take it to the next level from when you hang up that call. Well, meetings always used to have that level of organization, or should have always had that level of organization, whether using remote collaboration tools or not. You should have an agenda going in, you should have somebody taking notes, and you shouldn't right. break up the meeting until action items are assigned. And if you have a meeting that doesn't have action items, you shouldn't have had the meeting. So the fact that we're on video now isn't, isn't, I'm sure people are experiencing it for the first time or the, for the first time in a long time and they're seeing each other's faces and they're saying, wow, this is really cool. But at some point it gets back to that idea that did we have an agenda? What did we want to accomplish? Who's assigned to do it? And it's even more important that you keep that structure going forward. So Blair, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, yep. So I actually started um, a, a LinkedIn and a Twitter conversation about this. Is work from home going to be the new normal? And um, I, I got a lot of different um perspectives on this so i think what's going to happen is that this remote work is going to really be um very very i i think people are experiencing it now and seeing how how cool it is you know they don't have to commute um you know they don't have to dress up except for you know the top part for video um but people i think are really 
appreciating how much uh, how much more productive they are. You know, they don't have the water cooler stuff, which you know is pros and cons. But you know, people realize that they can be a lot more productive working from home. Part of the problem is management. You know, out of sight, out of mind. So when um, your manager isn't seeing you on a day to day basis, they're not you know walking over and tapping you on the shoulder. That can be a problem. So you need uh, managers to understand. You know, yes, you're still working even though you're there, and on the other perspective, you need your neighbors and friends to realize, even though you're at home, you're still working. So it, it's really important to, you know, set boundaries. Um, you know, don't do housework. Don't, you know, do errands. It, it's really important from the people perspective to, to to really follow best practices when it comes to that. Um, so I, I think people are really going to feel liberated from all this. So I think what's going to happen after all of this is over, you know, whenever that happens is that a lot of people are going to say, you know what, I've been really productive. I really like this. I don't have to spend time on my commute. You know, can I work from home, you know, two days a week or something, or maybe every Friday? So I think we're going to start seeing not 100%, but I think a lot of people are going to really move in this direction. Yeah, and I, I think that there's a, yeah. a lot of good points in about that. Um, I tried to echo and give some advice in my LinkedIn blog. I think I called it the definitive working from home guide. Um, and, you know, everybody liked it except one person thought I was being too uh, um, boast, boastful about being the definitive guide. But well, I've been saying for years, when you're working from home, you have to have a place to go to, preferably a room that's your workroom or a desk, or even if it's in the corner of a space, all the people that you're living with need to know that when you're in that place, you're at work and you have work rules going on. You're not going to answer the doorbell. I had a situation here where we, we had a, a, a bunch of workers that had to come into our house that, that were doing some work upstairs and then they left and I got on a call and my wife went to the store and one of the workers left their purse here and you know what I don't care if you lean on that bell for three hours if I'm in a call I'm at work I'm not answering that um, obviously when the call was over, I went up to do it. But the point is people need to know you're at work. They need to know the rules change. You need to know the rules change. It's not the same as just answering a message on your mobile device. You're sitting at your workspace working. And we all have to do those, uh, the, the, that change of mentality to understand and be productive. David, again, I cut somebody else off. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I just to go back to your original question of is, um, is this the new normal? Is this uh, the tipping point? Um, there's really, there's two parts of the question. You know, one is the social part. And Brent made a point, some people, I think maybe the majority of people, do like being around other people. And maybe if they're more productive at home, they might say instead of five days a week, three days a week go to the office, but they're gonna wanna go to the office. Uh, whereas I'm sure there's a lot of introverts watching this who are like, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good working from home, that's okay. I'll, I'll see you on holidays. I'll see you when we, when we have gatherings. There are a lot of people who socially will prefer this. But for me, the bigger question, you know, from a business point of view, bottom line is productivity. And we have this perception that when you're at home, you're watching your soaps, you're playing with your, your new kitty, uh, you're playing guitar, you're working two or three hours a day, but we keep you on the team because you're a special team member, we let you work at home. And I think we we realized that was wrong. And the tipping point isn't happening now. I think it happened a couple of years ago when we all mocked, uh, was it Yahoo? Yahoo. Yahoo, they had that policy. IBM. Yeah, yeah and, and it didn't work out for them, and we mocked them because enough of us know that our best, our, I keep using this line, but it's a great line, our most productive team members are wearing pajamas. My remote team, they're task killers. I put something on our remote cloud task board, and it just gets done. And sometimes well, David, it's 3 in the morning, sometimes it's 2 a, in the afternoon, but that's, we that's know a bigger, that the productivity a, is there. That's a bigger point, though, because, you know, again, it's not when you're a physical laborer, but for a knowledge worker, the, the, the concept that the knowledge workers need to be tracked by the hours and days that they put in is dead, and it needs to remain dead, and we need to kill it. And if well, it I'm not sure it's dead. It's, I'm not sure with it's dead. I think it's dying. It, well, you know, in, in some circles, I, it, it's probably different there in the UK because I do know some people that... In, uh, in my that, business, it's dead. I have no idea how many hours I work or how many hours anyone on my team works, but I could tell you what projects we got done this week because that's it's all, all gonna that be, matters is projects. It's all all going to be a matter of productivity. What have you been assigned? What are what are the goals that you have? And are those goals being accomplished? I'm very thankful to work for a company. I work for Poly. I'm very thankful to work for a company that offers flex time. We have no vacation days. You know, you need to go somewhere, go. Tell people that you're going, make sure that there's nothing on your plate that somebody else can't handle, but go. You want to work certain hours in the day, be where you need to be in order to do your job. 
If that means that, you know, obviously when there's no pandemic, if I need to fly um, to a city to be with a client, I'll be with that client. If I need to be at a conference, I'll be at a conference. If I don't need to be anywhere, I'm not adding two hours a day, a commute in and a commute back because you just get measured by your productivity and your results. And for knowledge workers, while you do still need that office when it's required, when you have to have a physical meeting, uh, measuring work by time by effort is is gone it, we are now in a case for knowledge workers where we're measuring work by effort go ahead mark i'm sorry no no that's great I, I wanted to jump in on that because you talk about business value and productivity and of course in the consulting industry and i think we're all going to be we're right there right now businesses are going to be in a real challenge to provide value when they don't have the same assets or they weren't working the same way in delivering products. So I think we're going to see a lot more innovation. I, I was just did that this last uh, Friday. I was supposed to go and, and meet some people at their fabrication facility and walk through some, you know, I would typically need to see the space and understand how their, how their manufacturing works. And I said, we're not going to go, let's do it virtual. And they walked me through virtually through their fabrication space, which is quite large. And that was actually extremely effective. So suddenly I didn't have to make a trip on the LIRR out an hour or two back and forth. And I was able to get a lot of work done. So it wasn't just about using it for meetings. It's about using it as, as, as a whole nother tool to get access to people and information that will make sure that the sessions that we do are required to be there in person are as effective as possible. Whether we're doing this from a home, you know, nomadic model into uh, the meeting space in, in our offices, or whether we're doing it to um, our production and fabrication and, and other other services, you know, doing site surveys, uh, all the ways that we would normally look at at the uh, at a, met a requirement to be in person is going to be a step back and reevaluate. And I think that's very very helpful, healthy for us to do uh, to do that reevaluation of where we actually need to be in person. But we do if need to think about a, this. Well, go ahead, Blair, and then I'll speak. Thanks, Brett. Um, so I, I was going to say we do need to think about the social aspect. And, you know, I've been working by myself at home for a long time, so I'm, I'm fine with it. But there is that social aspect that's um, left out. So one person on my um, responded to my Twitter comment that said um, that he's trying to do more surprise meetings of people in the virtual world by having his Zoom open for all his team members to wander in. So people can just kind of pop in. So you, you do get that social element. And um, I, I think people... And David, I think you're also doing like a, a um, cocktail party or happy hour or something. So we do need to find ways of having that social element happen. And that that's the one thing that I do think companies are struggling with right now. And especially for younger people, you know, for older generations like us, you know, we're fine, you know, leave me alone. I don't, I don't need to, uh, you know, be with people. But the uh, younger generations and the younger workers definitely do. So I, I think... If remote work does become more normal, um, we do have to come up with more ways of enhancing the, the social and, and just the creative and collab not collaborative like what we're doing, but, you know, just running into somebody and bouncing ideas off each other. And that's something that's that's missing, I think, from the remote work. If I could build off of uh, Blair's comment and uh, a few of the others, um, it seems to me that if remote work is going to become, I'll say, more of the norm, not necessarily the norm. Um, there was some reference to managers, and sometimes managers feel insecure about people mm -hmm. working remotely and so forth. And so it would seem to me that there's going to need to be some training for managers on Oops. how to handle and work with remote workers because there has to be a real high level of trust there and there has to be some proof points and there has to be you know some mechanisms to make sure that you know if somebody like David said David Maldo said if they're working in their jammies are they really getting their work done or are they just doing things so i think that's one side of it is how do you manage remote workers? There needs to be some thinking and some training put into that ultimately down the road. And the other is for the remote worker, what are the best practices? Blair mentioned several of those and, and, and there may be a difference of opinion even on this call about what is the best practice. For example, um, I choose to, to dress as if I were gonna go to work every single day and I try to be there at the hour when I'm supposed to be there. But that's that's all in my own head, you know. But I work all hours of the day and night. 
but at least there's there's some there's some uh, routine I'll say that that I try to do because that helps me psychologically get things done. And maybe there will need to be some additional uh, informing by HR departments and so forth to people that are going to work from home on some of those best practices and what the expectations are. And I'll stop and listen now to the, to the other I, I was just going to uh, say, panelists. actually, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to flip it over and say, how can you guarantee that people are working in the office? Because I know many people, I've worked with them in the past, that are professional meeting attendees. And they spend their whole life in meetings and they spend their whole life answering emails and then they have some coffee and some lunch and then have a few more meetings. And you, you can't measure those results, but they're in the office. And then they're the sort of people that then question people working from home. So I think that, as everyone said, we need to have clear objections, uh, sorry, clear ob objectives and direction must be set by managers at regular times, not to sort of uh, command and control, but to ensure that the communication uh, channels are established to help people prioritize work appropriately, to remain productive and, and measure by results. You know, if I get my report done in one day, um, does that not mean that maybe I can take it a little bit easier tomorrow? And, and, and if I worked into the evening, maybe I could do some shopping in the morning. I well, don't it's know. A very, maybe we need to think about the way that we, we produce our work. It's a very important point. And, and I've had this, you know, I've had, obviously, since I've been advocating for this for so many years, I've had this debate with people for a lot of years. And when you say, well, I need to keep the people in the office because I can't trust that they might not be starting on time and they might not be ending on time. And, you know, I don't know if they're out of sight, out of mind, if they're not really going to be working on things. Are those really the people that you want on your team to begin with? Are those the hires that you should have? They should probably not be knowledge workers. They should probably be in a different role where, you know, nine to five is forced on them. But yeah, I agree with you. There are plenty of people that come into a regular office building in a regular corporate environment that are not productive during the day. They're just walking in and walking out. And there are so many studies that have been done, um, uh, one by uh, uh, Stanford and, and, and a couple others that I know I've quoted over the years that show if you take that morning and afternoon commute out, of somebody's typical day, that productivity generally goes something like 80 or 90% back into the work as opposed to that. And people who get that opportunity to do that are happier. It's such a win-win and it's good for the environment and everything else. So yeah, the, you know, obviously it's, it's not meant for everybody. And Brent, I totally agree with you. You must have discipline and a routine. And if you cannot self-discipline yourself, it's not for you. Uh, but, but keeping all of that in mind for the right job, for the right workers, um, I really think it's definitely the future because, you know, Tim, as we were talking about before the call started, you know, if, if I'm a manager and I need to hire the best person for my team and they need to come into an office building that's an hour, an hour and a half away from their house, that limits the pool of employees that I can get. But if I can hire the best person from anywhere in the world, all of a sudden now I can bring in the best and brightest regardless of where they are, if they're able to self-motivate, handle the tools, know and understand and be trained how to work remotely. So I, I definitely think it's a tipping point. Well, uh, one quick comment on um, how do we know if people are, are working? And you're right, we don't want to track people by hours. I mean, we could, there are, there are solutions that um, you can have remote team members when they're at their desk, they log in and it tracks that their time working. Um, I don't recommend that, uh, but I do think it's possible just based on the projects. And we have so many amazing, I'm not even gonna recommend any because there's dozens and dozens and dozens of amazing project management tools. And hopefully you're not managing 10,000 people. If, if, if so, your structure isn't right. You should be managing few enough people that you know what they're doing. And you meet with them, not every day to make them crazy, not every day to babysit with them, but whether it's twice a week or once a week, and you screen share, and you open up the project management, and you say, okay, you were assigned these four tasks. What is your status on these four tasks? And they say, say, well, I'm at a roadblock on this, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this. You know, they're working. And if they go, well, it's, it's been a crazy week, <laughs> you know, they're not working. Um, if things are getting done, things are getting done. And you know what? If there's someone on your team who's taking advantage of you, because they're really only working 10 hours a week, but they're doing so many projects that do you think they're working 80 hours a week? That's a win for you, it's a win for them, it's a win for everyone. As long as the work you need to get done is getting done. And I think even in the office now, that's how we should be tracking it. This person clocked in at this time and clocked out at that time. That doesn't mean anything to me, what did they do? Well, let's look at their management board. Let's look at their project task board. They're working on these tasks, this is their status. Yeah, that's, no that's questions a great about point. what they're doing.
Yeah, I, I wanted to come on uh, talk about that for a second and also go back to what Blair was saying. Um, the check-in early and often, David, right, and, and that you're, you're able to reach them. And that goes to, and we haven't mentioned that, that, that this video, and it, the whole concept of call escalation, you know, the ability to go from an IM chat into a video call is absolutely critical to create this workflow where you're able to go, I'm going to, I need to interrupt you now, and now I'm just going to IM you. And, and so this is, it's really an arsenal of tools and, and not just different separate uh, isolated uh, systems, and I think from Blair's perspective about you know the the concept about um, collisions, I, I call it collisions, or meeting with people, right? And, and the value of gathering and getting together with people goes back to I think a challenge we have about how we measure productivity because we were talking about w what is productivity, and in in many cases. The, the, the rudimentary process of productivity is, you know, I'm, I'm able to produce a document or I'm able to be efficient with my time, I'm able to do a task. And what we're missing from that is innovation and how do we be creative problem solvers. And in those kinds of scenarios, we have to be careful about an isolation now in this model of only talking to people that we know, only talking through methods that we are familiar with because we're going to get very much in a circle of knowledge trapped within a, a group, right? And where innovation and where real knowledge awareness happens is when, like right now on this call, I'm meeting and talking to you guys and learning from your perspectives and I don't know you. If I'm surrounded with my own group of people because I'm familiar with them, I'll start to become much more uh, isolated and, and I will create blinders in my knowledge and awareness. I think we have to be careful about that in, in this new model. Well, look, there are a couple of points that I'll respond to that on. Uh, one, 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 because you just brought it up at the end, which is the concept of diversity of thought, which I completely yeah. embrace. And we've seen in our industry, and I'm not going to name names, but we've seen in our industry people who came in and took over, you know, a collaboration group that made the choice to hire people that thought only like her. And, and, and the result of that is everybody else quit. And they, they, you get all those yeses, so you don't know what your blind spots are. One of the most important rules of management is to hire people that are smarter than you and hire people that think differently than you, because you do get that diversity of ideas, which is critical as a manager. And, you know, I'm, uh, I, I don't think she's in that role anymore, but that's definitely one of the things that you can see uh, destroys productivity. Um, the other point that I'll make um, about what you were talking about was the escalation. Absolutely. I, again, I'm a remote worker. I'm here in New Jersey. The majority of my company is working in California. We have people in Texas. We have people all over the place. How do we communicate? Well, there's, there's certain tools and tricks that we use. Managers send out a day book every day in many cases. Hey, this is the date. This is the time. These are the big projects the whole team is working on. I know this person's on vacation. This person's visiting today. You get that as an email in the morning. You know what's going on. Uh, my team uses what they call a stand-up, which is we go into the, um, the, the, uh, the, the team chat application that we have, and everybody puts in one line of what they're working on that day and you can think of it as a task and put in your one line and be done with it or you can think of it as an opportunity for collisions where somebody says hey you're working on that i'm working on that too let's have a conversation when i want to talk to my team's admin you know the she runs the the, the world for us and and she's terrific you know i'll say hey do you have a second what are the answers to the hey do you have a second instant message they're either no yes i can i am but i can't chat or they click and they join you over video and those collisions become instant so again it replaces everything you would have in the office if you're comfortable with the tools. So let me use that as an opportunity to kind of pivot just for a second um, and and talk about how our industry is responding to this challenge. Because I think almost every provider and every organization um, has, has stepped up and said, you know what, use our platform. We want to make our tools available. We want to make them available at no charge. Blair, you, you're one of the, the analysts in our industry that's actually started tracking that. You want to give us a quickie list? Well, it, it's fortunately, it isn't that quickie. Um, there's a list about, I don't know, 25 or so um, companies that have really uh, stepped up and they're, so companies are doing anything from, you know, free offerings for three months to, you know, NGOs or education to some people. It's funny, some vendors are like, oh, we're offering, you know, free licenses. Well, you've already been offering free licenses. So, you know, back, back up on that a little bit. But But there are a lot of companies that are, you know, Offering, you know, three month free, um, free usage for certain types of industries. Um, there's a lot of um, startup type kits, you know, work at home um, or work remotely kits. Um, one thing I found that's that's kind of interesting is the contact center vendors are also coming into play here. Um, they're offering tools for uh, remote workers and 
uh, remote uh, work at home uh, kits for contact centers, because I think that's really important. Um, so we've got, uh, let's see, uh, Blue Jeans offering free access to video conferencing to first responders and NGOs and reducing its entry level uh, pricing by 20%. Um, free, 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 uh, free, free months here, free, free months there. Um, expanding capabilities for, um, let's see, Cisco free WebEx, um, nice and contact free work from home module. Um, Google offering free access to Hangouts, um, Dollapad offering Dollapad Pro, uh, Ring Central offering Ring Central Office for free for three months. Um, there's just a whole list of this. And, and I, I think it's just wonderful how these vendors have really, um, you know, obviously there's some self serving in it, but I, I think vendors have really done a great job of trying to, um, you know, at, well, I called my article Vendors Come to the Rescue in, um, in response to the coronavirus. So two two um, quick questions for you, Blair. First of all, um, how can people find your list? How can they find that online? Um, it's on bcstrategies.com. I wrote an article. Um, I think it's something like um, Business Communication Vendors to the Rescue in Light of Coronavirus. So if you go okay. to BC Strategies. And we also did a podcast kind of similar to what we have here about um, uh, what's going on. And we're going to be doing one this week on best practices. Uh, so if you go to BC Strategies, you can find that. Thank you Terrific. for asking. Okay. No, because I think that's a good resource. And I know Erwin Lazar, who's not going to be on this one, but is going to be on our next webcast, also put together a list. So I just want to make sure people have the resources. Now, the other question is, I'm not, you know, I, I obviously work for a manufacturer. Um, I've, I've spent, you know, 30 of my 40 years in this industry, 40 plus years as an end user, though. And if, if I'm paying, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars for a collaboration platform that all of a sudden I see my collaboration provider giving away for free. Uh, aren't this for everybody? Aren't I going to raise my hand and say, uh, excuse me, um, you're, you're giving away this stuff for free to the other guys, but, but you're making me still pay for it. I don't think that's fair. Is there going to be a downside to that or are people going to be asking for well, refunds? Before we go on to that really, really important topic, David, one thing I want to talk, say is that you need to take a long term view, even when selecting technologies in an emergency, because businesses need to take a calculated long term view of the adoption of any new technology, because you, you've got to resist this impulse decision making to make sure that you make smart investments, even if it's free. There's still an investment around free. You're going to be tying up resources, you're going to be tying up IT support to, to onboard people. You've got to think of the longer term impact on businesses, its employees and all the processes. So, you know, just. Bear in mind, you know, I, I was always a firm believer of uh, buy in haste, repent at leisure. And uh, the same applies here, no matter if even in an emergency, just make sure that, you know, it will it will have a longer term impact on the business. And even if it's free, it will still impact the business in terms of people, support costs and processes. Very good points. I, I'm not well, sure to, if people to are. To that are, point. Oh, I'm sorry, Brent. Go, go, ahead. go ahead, Mark. I, I just not sure how much right now people are, are claiming, wait, uh, how come you're giving it away for free in terms of what we're seeing in the crisis? Maybe, maybe in time, but I, I think that the sense of, uh, of, of well-being and caring for people in this crisis is out trumping that. However, I, I, and to add to your list, Blair, uh, T-Mobile, for example, is offering, and it's not just the collaboration tool, but it's having the, the connectivity, right, uh, to be able to use it. And T-Mobile is offered, what was it, 60 days? Uh, we're, uh, for for everybody, whether they have an account is automatic. Spectrum seems to be saying uh, we'll give you free. Well, if you if you're a new new user, we'll give you 60 days if you're new, right? So some all of a sudden someone's going to start adding to their service. I don't think that was a very fair model. And in either case, it was difficult to find the links. You know, you find the news you know announcement that they're offering it, but then to find the way to get to the Three sixty days was was seen to be problematic, so I, I think that's a challenge there. If you're going to do it, you got to make it easy to do the join and make the link happen. Sorry, yeah, and in, in the list that I have in my article, um, it does have the link to everything. And adding on to what you said, Mark, um, TBS Telecom, they also they said that they're going to be providing um, broadband access to low income individuals and families with children and college students for sixty days. Um, so I, yeah, everyone I think is stepping up, and also I think. Um, what we're seeing also is, you know, every vendor also, you know, on their website, they have, you know, tips for work at home and all that stuff. And we're also starting to see, um, like, Altitude Software, they've got a three-day virtual classroom for contact centers to train agents and get them certified in three hours um, to be able to, um, you know, join the workforce and also work remotely. Because now there's a scramble. Um, you know, all these companies, um, 
you know, travel companies, hospitality companies, they're all scrambling now for um, additional agents to take up the, um, the load. So I think companies are also stepping up by saying, you know, hey, we can help you get those remote workers started. We can do some training for you. So that's another way that companies are pitching in. Go ahead, Brent. You had a point to make? Well, I, I, I was, and it was really, you know, we have five experts on the call. And if people are looking for recommendations from us as to which of all these tools, because there's lots that you can choose from. Clearly, Blair has a long list, and there's others that, that are out there. What would you recommend if people needed to get something so that they could communicate just like we are today and do it fairly quickly? I have I have three or four that I personally use on a regular basis, and, and maybe I use them because I'm most comfortable with them, but I guess one of the questions would be, if you had to get up and get started fairly quickly and, and, and without a lot of, you know, to Tim's point, you may not have a lot of time to study stuff because you're quarantined today, and so you have to do something within the next day or two. What are the tools that, that this group might recommend for people to look at well, I I'm going to certainly ask each of you as we end this call, which we, we have still have a few more minutes, uh, but to let people know how to get in touch with you. And I, I'm I'm happy to make um, industry agnostic recommendations for what I think works and what I think doesn't. And and you know the <clears throat> if if. If there were, if, if we only needed one tool and we all carried around a hammer and that's all it was, that'd be great. And the first time we needed to put up a pane of glass, we'd all be dead. So depending upon what your needs are, there are different tools that are better and worse for you. So I'll certainly ask people how to get in touch with you on the internet, um, directly by email, whatever the, the best way to reach you is. And I'm sure we'll all be very happy to make, you know, the best that we can off the cuff recommendations based on circumstances. And some of us are consultants, you know, I, I was a consultant, so, you know, they don't be surprised if somebody says well you know in order to do this for you you know hire me as a consultant but in terms of quick recommendations to help you out i mean that's the whole goal of what the imcca is doing right now we've been the nonprofit organization uh supporting collaborative communication in the ucnc industry for over 20 years and my entire goal and our entire goal in doing this webinar and all of the other webinars that we're going to be doing over the course of the next few weeks is how can we put people with knowledge and people with with content um and and people who have camaraderie um, and people who have jokes and who are, you know, we were doing one with comedians on Wednesday evening. How can we get those people to use the tools that, that are available to us to help us all get through this crisis? And believe me, if you guys think you had a hard time <clears throat> clicking on the tool and getting training and figuring out how to use this thing, imagine how I did it with five global comedians. That's going to be an interesting webcast that's coming up tomorrow that uh, that hopefully everybody will join in and like. But but again, that that's our role. So we're happy to help make those connections for people. So, Dave, going back though, can I answer the question previous um, oh, yeah. about whether people are going to complain about, um, hey, you know, people are getting it for free, I already paid. Um, pe some people will complain, and they shouldn't. Uh, I think the reason people are going to complain is because there's some, there's some, I don't want to say terrible people, but it's wrong to, if a company is doing something nice, you should support that company. You should do more business with that company. You should buy more licenses from them if they're helping out. If, if you uh, ever go to Reddit, there's um, a, something called the subreddit, which is a, a, a page worth a list of stories, and it is called the Choosing Beggars subreddit. And it's story after story like this. And people get publicly shamed on the internet because they do this. I saw one, it was a Facebook thing. A pizza place said, hey, we're going to have a free to go calzones for elementary students because they're not getting school lunches at our local pizza place. And we was like, wow, that's so nice. And one person's like, oh yeah, well, what about the elderly? We have special needs too. Where's our free calzones? It's like, they can't give free calzones to everyone. So are you gonna, are you gonna shame the person that's, um, you know, are you gonna shame the person that's giving the free calzones? Or are you gonna support them? Good point. That's a very good point. So I was having a conversation with a, a, a actually text chat with a good friend of mine yesterday, and we both said that, that if this wasn't such a scary health crisis with so many horribly disastrous, uh, disastrously affected people and the economy being destroyed, this would actually be a really cool technical social experiment. Um, how many of these services are going to hold up to this new stress? Thank you very much, Blue Jeans. So far, we've been making this call and nothing has failed. Um, I'm sure it's going to take a while for me to download it because their processors are, are probably overloaded. But, you know, I still appreciate them providing the service. Will the Internet hold up? 
I was, you know, I was on the phone with uh, Verizon this morning because of all times for uh, for my FiOS router to start being flaky. It started being flaky today. They're overnighting me another one. So, you know, depending upon how deliveries go, at least uh, at least it hasn't crashed for this call yet. I don't want to jinx it. But, you know, do we think these the, the technical infrastructure, just like the, you know, will our plumbing hold up if everybody flushes at the same time? Will our Internet hold up and our, our platforms hold up if everybody starts using them the way the companies have been asking for us to use them? Uh, any thoughts? I'll, I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you one thing, David, uh, with with all the tech vendors that are now working from home, I bet you there's an awful lot of UI changes, a lot more functionality that gets added. There's a lot of technology vendors are forced to use their own products. You know, eat your own dog food, drink your own champagne. You're doing it for real now. So I expect there's going to be an awful lot of feature feature changes there. True. Um, one thing that is interesting, though, is um, if you were a largely premise based IT shop, and we're suddenly told, you know, everyone work from ho home. How, um, how, how daunting is that compared to the scalability and flexibility of perhaps a cloud service? I, I wonder how many IT departments have really struggled with their, with their uh, data center, you know, sort of uh, scaling up their data center and, and, and spinning up servers to try and uh, deal with that increase in demand. You may get a lot so more So maybe this whole thing is a hoax. Absolutely. Go ahead, Blair. So maybe this whole thing is a hoax that the cloud vendors have um, perpetrated because everyone's going to be moving to the cloud now. Well, let's let's be careful about about that. Not not I know you're you're jesting, but honestly, yesterday I did get an email from one of the major cloud providers that all of us on this call know, and they said, "Oh, we are reducing some of the services that we have." For example, one of the things they said is that we're cutting back on the bandwidth or, or on the uh, video resolution that you may be able to to use from our cloud-based service. And so it calls into question really how elastic are even these cloud-based services. You know, we think of them as having infinite capacity and they can just roll things out. But maybe in this kind of an epidemic or pandemic, maybe they can't really do that to the level that we all thought they could. Does that make sense? Like sure. I said, it's well, there social was an article program. yesterday. Uh, yeah, I saw an article yesterday that said um, Zoom is – uh, they reported that their software had some degraded performance. And then there was also an article about Microsoft Teams that it had gone down for a couple hours, uh, I think once or twice. So companies are starting to experience some of the problems with everyone, you know, as you said, flushing all, all at once. Yeah, and that's, that's why I think we, you, we do. you pick two, right? You don't have just one uh, solution in your pocket. In fact, I think there's really two different applications that, that I'm seeing is that I would use a tool like a Microsoft Office uh, Teams tool when I'm working with my peers, and then I've got a separate Zoom tool that I'm using with my clients because of the methodologies and ease of presentation with one as opposed to the way I can share and move about with, with applications. But I think that the, the key here um, about the uh, the world that we're we're coming into is it happened you know just a couple of weeks ago when Dave and I were at CES we're talking about where 5G is and where's you know Wi Fi six and the need for uh, Brent you're doing that AI right and all this bandwidth and what what is what what is we were at a point where uh, we were trying to influence uh, manufacturers trying to influence consumers saying you need this right. You don't, you don't, we're going to put stuff, make it possible for you to have it in the future. You don't know you're going to need it, but you're going to need it. Well, I think, you know what? I think it's going to be really clear that you're going to, that everyone now knows they're going to need it. They're going to need more bandwidth. They're going to need more access. They're going to need more mobile. So we actually have, I think, in, you know, six months, eight months time, a really good case for, for legitimizing, you know, the demand from a consumer level suddenly will, will offset what, what, the, what the manufacturers were, in, were, were trying to say. Yep, and I think it's also a good point that I read somewhere that, you know, I don't think the internet bandwidth is going up. The home broadband usage is going up, while the office, fixed office premise bandwidth is being less utilized. So it's 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 sort of a shift of resources. Um, but, you know, it's it, it, we're talking about it, you know, after a few days. Let's see where we are after a few weeks and see what's going on. All right, so um, let's um, let's go around the horn one more time and uh, give everybody a chance to talk about how we can uh, reach out to everybody. So I'm going to do this in the reverse order I did it last time, looking at the the blue jeans list. Tim Banting, why don't you start? How can people get in touch with you if they have questions or comments or want to hear or read about what you've done? Sure. Okay, David. Yes. So you can reach out um, to me via Twitter. So at T Banting, 
or via LinkedIn. Those are probably the best ways to uh, get in contact with me. Terrific. Thank you very much, Tim. Mark, how does someone reach out to you? Okay, so um, I'm at Chen Milson and Wilkie, so uh, M Peterson at smwllc.com. I'm also starting a new uh, posting that I'll be doing on uh, mlpeterson.com on uh, on remote working, uh, the, the digital nomad, uh, which I hope I hope you guys will see as well. Terrific. Thank you very much, Mark. Look forward to that. David, how does somebody reach out to you? Yes, uh, we are putting out a lot of content now on remote team working, so you could find us at letsdovideo.com or on Twitter at Let's Do Video. Terrific. Thank you very much, David. Brent? You can get a hold of me by going to my website. That's kelcor, K-E-L-C-O-R.com, or you can uh, find me on LinkedIn, or my email is bkelly, B-K-E-L-L-Y, at kelcor.com. Terrific. Thanks very much. And Blair, how does someone reach out to you? On Twitter, I'm Blair Plez, B-L-A-I-R-P-L-E-Z. My email is blairpleasant at confusion.com, and you can also find me on bcstrategies.com. That's great. Thank you guys very much. This is a terrific conversation. Good to explore these points. As I said before, this is one of many special uh, webcasts that the IMCCA are going to be doing throughout this pandemic. Our goal is to try and hook up content leaders and thought leaders with people that can really use the information. Uh, most of the people that you saw on the call today, in fact, probably them and a few more, will be joining us on Thursday for a call to talk about some of the topics that you may have missed at some of the recent uh, conferences and trade shows that have been canceled or may be canceled. Um, and then tomorrow, um, uh, Wednesday, uh, the 18th, as I'm, we're recording this, uh, we're going to be doing a, a, a virtual global meal. Uh, we've got about 100 people signed up for that, and Zoom is providing the platform for that, and they say it goes up to 500. So come on, guys, let's try and break it. And, um, and then uh, uh, virtual comedians tomorrow night as well. So I'm David Danto. You can uh, best way to find me is just Google me, um, and you can uh, get me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, via three or 400 different kind of emails. Thank you very much for joining joining us. Thank you, Blue Jeans, for providing the platform. Thank you to my guests. Um, and, you know, if we stay together and keep chatting, we'll all get through this. So thanks very much.